Good day to you, wherever you are, wherever you're watching this. Welcome to uh, a discussion of why you keep your honor clean. The purpose of this discussion is to lay out for anybody who has to make decisions under pressure in the gray area that exists between the obviously black and the obviously white decisions that people make. And if you're in the Marine Corps, or in any branch of the service that does this, then I think it's very important that you watch this and understand why it's important to you to keep your honor clean. The subject of this is a Army PFC by the name of Bernardo Simpson. The interviews you'll see come from 1970 and 1988. Sadly, he's the best example I've ever found of why you need to keep your honor clean. So, sit back, relax, take this all in, do some thinking about what it is to keep your honor clean, why it's important to you, and then go out and do it. Simple Fidelis. We spoke to five of the American soldiers who were at Milai on March 16, 1968. They were James Berthold of Niagara Falls, New York, Gary Garfolo of Stockton, California, Gary Crosley of Del Rio, Texas, Bernardo Simpson of Jackson, Mississippi, Uh, New York. He was from New York by the name of Rocker. And uh, he was walking. I have, was walking point. I was walking in front of him. And I think I was about 10 or 15 feet in front of him. And uh, I stepped in the same area he did. And I, as I approached this bush, I heard something go up and it knocked me down. So after the dust and the, all the brush cleared the way, there wasn't anything left of him. He was totally gone. We had got led into the field by this officer. Was supposed to be knowing where he was going. Was supposed to be reading the map, and he couldn't. Well, there was no certain age not to kill. There was everyone to kill. He was in me line. I may lie out some may or something like that, some might. And we, this afternoon, one, a week after, we had this orders. Our captain, Medina, was telling us about we was going in and burn down and kill everything that was in the village. And uh, that we would leave nothing standing. as women, children, babies, cows, cats, anything. And that morning, about 7 o'clock, we boarded the choppers and we went into the village. And when we got off the chopper, we started shooting. And uh, I remember from the first incident, as I was coming up on an area, there was a man got up with a weapon and ran into a hamlet. And this lady got up and she ran and turned and had a back turned to me. And uh, my platoon leader, Lieutenant LaCrosse, told me to shoot her. And I said, no, well, you shoot her. Man. I don't want to shoot no lady, you know. So he said, well, I'm getting a direct order to shoot, and if you don't shoot her, that you can be shot yourself. So as she'd be putting her foot in the door, I shot her about five or six times. And I went there and turned over, and there was a little three-month-old baby on the arms, which I thought it was a, a gun, you know, and it just kind of cracked me up. Was the baby dead? Yes, it was dead. The bullets had gone through her? Yes. Then what happened after that? Well, after that, uh, we had gathered about five prisoners, and they told us the goddess. And then here come one of the guys in my squad said, well, let's kill him. So the platoon, he said, well, I'm turning my back, so I, I don't see what you're doing. And this guy had an M79, a grenade launcher, and you can't shoot a grenade launcher into a group because you can blow up yourself. So he grabbed my rifle and just went to the heads, everyone, and put it between the eyes and just pulled the trigger. And from there, it sort of... Yeah. 
group. Yeah, it's growing. They said, uh, well, my platoon leader told me, he said, my uh, officer, the lieutenant said, well, go in and kill everyone. If you don't kill it, I'm going to watch you all day. And if you don't kill everyone, then uh, you can be shoot, shot yourself. So as I went in, I was, he was always near me anyway. So I think I killed about 18 or 20 people. And, uh, Were any of these people children? Uh, that was two. Yes. And the rest of them were old men? Well, between ages, young and old. Young and yeah. old. Did you see what else was going on in the hamlet? Oh, yes. I saw Lieutenant Kelly, what he said about this, this uh, grave that they had, this big massive ditch. I think it was about, oh, about 50 people at a time. They would put two machine guns on each side and put two people with rifles, automatic rifles. And he was standing over them, and he said, shoot them. So he just killed all of them, all 50 of them. And then they would make another pile of them, put them in a ditch, and then get another 50 and shoot them and do them the same way. Did you see any burning of the hamlets? Oh, yes, we burned all the hamlets. Everything was burned out, yes. We put people in the hamlets and killed them and burned them. Well, they figured that the babies, when they grew up, they will be BC anyway. So why give them an the opportunity to grow up? Well, it was mutilate the bodies and everything, you know. It was hang them or something like this, or scalp them, anything. They enjoyed, they really enjoyed it, cut their throats. Well, at night, well, we said, everyone was talking about how many they killed and all this, you know, how they killed them and everything. Once we got back, they told us not to talk to anyone. Well, our platoon sergeants told us not to mention this to anyone, not to say anything about it. What do you think a war crime is? What do I consider a war crime? Yeah. I consider a war crime of being over there. Just the idea of being there. Can you tell me, Fernando, what, what this book is? It's, why, why you've kept it? This is my life. This is my past, this is my present, and this is my future. And I keep it you know, to remind me. But it's always, it's always there. I don't, you know, I just, this is it. This is my life. This is everything. This is the way I am. This is what made me this way. I've seen the enemy, yes. But who is the enemy? You know, he had little kids over there that would shoot you or stab you in the back when you walk away. You know, who, who is the enemy? How can you distinguish between the enemy? the good or the bad, all of them look the same. That's, that's the reason the war was so different. You know, you, you, it wasn't like the Germans over here, or the Japanese over there. They, was, they all look like North and the South. You know, so how can you tell? I was 19 when I went to Vietnam. I was a rifleman specialist, fourth class. I was trained to kill, but the reality of killing someone is different from training and pulling the trigger. You know. So you knew when you went into the village that if you found women, old men, children, anything that was living, you knew that you were going to have to kill them that day? From women and children to dogs and cats, yes. Yes. So, but I didn't know it, that I was going to do that. I knew the women and children was there, but for me to say that I was going to kill them, I didn't know I was going to do that until it happened. I didn't know I was going to kill anyone. I didn't want to kill anyone. I wasn't raised up to kill. You know? Now, she was running with her back from a tree line, but she was carrying something. I didn't know if it was a weapon or what, but it was a woman. You know, I knew it was a woman. I didn't want to shoot a woman. But I was given an order to shoot. So I'm thinking that she had a weapon running. So when I shot and I turned over, it was a baby. You know, shot about four times, three or four times. And the bullet just went through and shot the baby too. You know? And I turned over and I saw the baby face with a half gone. You know? 
<clears throat> and I just, I just blinked. I just went. The training came to me, the programming to kill. And I just started killing. What do you mean you just started killing? Did you go looking for people to kill or what? You didn't have to look. It was there. They was trying to get away. But they was just there. It wasn't hard to kill. It wasn't hard to find anyone to kill. That day in my life, I was personally responsible for killing between 20 and 25 people. About 25 people. Personally. Men From women. shooting them, to cutting their throats, to scalping them, to cutting off their hands, and cutting out their tongue. I did that. Why did you do all that? You didn't tell me. Why did you why did you kill the man do that? I just went. My mind just went. I didn't wasn't the only one that did it. A lot of other people did it. I just killed once I started the, the training, the whole programming part of killing. It just came out. But your training didn't tell you to scalp people or to cut ears. No. Or... No. But a lot of people were doing it. So I just followed suit. I just lost all sense of direction, of purpose. I just started killing any kind of way I could kill. It just came. I didn't know I had it in me. But like I said, after I killed the child, my whole mind just went. It just went. And once you start, it's very easy to keep on. Once you start, the hardest, the hardest part is to kill. But once you kill, that's become easier to kill the next person and the next one and the next one. Because I had no feelings or no emotions or no nothing, no direction. I just killed. Him. You lined up people. You were you were one of the people who was mowing down big groups of people. A group of about ten. Yes. What happened? Did you round them up? And... We just round them up, put them in a circle, and put me, a couple more guys, and just put the M16 on automatic, and just mow them down. Just killed them. Have you ever seen any um, photographs of the people you killed? Yes, yes. Have you got those photographs? I have photographs of the people I killed. Which photographs are they? <clears throat> the man, the child, the woman, and the baby. How can you bear to look at those today? Because this is my life. This is my life. Even if I don't open a book, I see it. In my nightmares. Anyway, if I never open this book, it's still there. You know? How can you forgive? You know, I can't forgive myself for the things, even though I know it was something that I did and something that I was told to do. But how can I forgive that? I forgive. I can't. I live with it every day. It's easy for you to say, well, you go ahead with your life. But how can you go ahead with your life when this is holding you back? How can I can't put my mind to anything positive because it's always negative? These people were tortured by this. They, they uh, were kids, 18, 19 years old. Most of them had never been away from home before they went to the service. And they end up in Vietnam. And in a moment, in a moment, following orders, in a context in which they've been trained, prepared to follow orders, 
they do what they're told and they shouldn't have and they look back a day later and realize that they probably made the biggest mistake of their life. There are only a few people who were in those circumstances who had the presence of mind and the strength of their own character that would see them through that circumstance. Most people didn't, and for most of them, even people that I, I, I personally just was stunned to discover that they'd made the wrong choice, they did. And they had to live with it. They have to live with it. And so do I. So do we all. There's a part of me that's kind and gentle. There's another part of me that's evil and destructive. Very evil and destructive. There's more destructiveness in my mind than goodness. There's more wanting to kill or to hurt than to love or to care. I don't let anyone get close to me. The loving feeling or the caring feeling is not there. And that was caused by Milai. That was caused by Milai. <clears throat> My little boy playing in my grandmother's front yard here in Jackson, at, my, at his grandmother's house. And some teenagers across the street got into an argument. It was 14 and 15. And one went home and got a gun. And the other one just ran in the direction where my little boy was playing. And he shot, and shot him in the head. I was in the house. And I came out and picked him up, but he was already dead. He was dying. So when I looked at him, his face looked like the same face of the child that I had killed. And I said, this is the punishment for me killing the people that I killed. And when the picture that I had, they had his funeral. I got back from the funeral that night. That's the way it cracked. I left it like that. It just cracked. <sighs> How much of this stuff do you have? I take... I take 1,200 milligrams every four hours, four times a day. Of drugs, of medication. I have to take it. I need it. That's the only thing that helped me somewhat stable, not as nervous. I stay nervous, even with the medication. But if I don't take it, I go. I just go off. Just keep me under control. It helps me. Because if I don't, I may do something to someone, even though I still have a tendency to think that of hurting someone. But the medication helps me, it really helps me. But I had to take a lot of it. And it's strong. It's very strong. Do you think this um, really dr dreadful condition that you're in, this uh, you know, terrible life that you're leading, do you think it's ever going to come to an end? Yeah, when I kill myself, it have to come to an end. Like I said, I tried suicide three times. Maybe the man of the good Lord is not ready for me to go because I could have been dead with all the stuff I had taken and tried to. But eventually, it's not out of my mind. Like I'm sitting talking to you now, I can't promise that when you come again, I'll be here. Because before you came, I had to get out of the hospital for, from trying suicide for the third time. The uh, good Lord doesn't appear to have treated you very well to have put you through all this. I still believe in him, but I guess life, you live a life for a reason, for a purpose. Now, what that purpose is to have me still here, I don't know. <clears throat> Are you um, ashamed? Oh, sorry for what you've done. Yes, I'm ashamed. I'm sorry. I'm guilty. But I did it. You know, what, what else can I tell you? It happened. You're looking at someone that did it. It can happen if you go to war. Those are the type of things that will happen and can happen 
to anyone. After they train you and they program you, it can happen. It happens. That's reality. That's what war is. War is not something that I shoot at you, you shoot at me. Well, we take time out. You know, well, don't shoot me here, don't shoot me there. You, the war is war. It's killing all type of ways. And that's where we don't need another war. At the end of the day, when it's all said and done, you keep your honor clean for you. You have to live with your actions for the rest of your life. You have to put your head on your pillow every night for the rest of your life. The Marine Corps is merely a collateral beneficiary of your honorable actions. After watching Barnado Simpson, the lessons of his life are clear. Nobody can rescue you from your negligent or dishonorable actions. Therefore, it's in your best interest to act honorably for you. Other people will certainly benefit from it. Institutions will benefit from it. But the life, as you just saw, that you or I would be condemned to, if we fail to keep our honor clean is an absolutely brutal and as you can see in Varnado Simpson's example unbearable life thanks for watching this go do good things go be an honorable leader and do that for you All Marine Radio, Mike McNamara, out.